Hello and welcome back to Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. On this late, late Monday night, it's about 11 p.m. Eastern time as I'm recording this. But that's for good reason. I've stayed up. We've got two great guests joining me on tonight's podcast, along with Jimmy Martin, Match Wars, or the usuals. Uh, on tonight's episode 177 on the night of September 16th here. We've got a week two recap for you. Potentially the craziest week of D2 football we've had in quite some time. So many upsets inside of the top 25. I'll recap a lot of those. Do my best. We got multiple top five teams beat by unranked or potentially lower top 25 type squads that we're nothing going to talk about division three we have i believe three overtime games to recap in the d3 slate i'm excited about nai week two recap with schwarzler later on and uh just a lot of big time storylines from small school football right now really excited about it joining us uh first from a guest standpoint will be brady perryman the wide receiver from minnesota state moorhead coming off a massive dub over duluth the first time the dragons have taken out the bulldogs since 1999 and then later on in the pod hayden sanders from st john's part of that defensive effort that had 10 sacks and a big time win against wartburg he will join me there as well but before we get into the episode Let's highlight the players of the week this week from the Division I Reject Squad over here, as well as the College Football Networks. Taking a look at these ones from the last, the last week, excuse me, uh, Terrell Davis from Central Oklahoma. We'll talk about the Bronchos later. 14 catches, 203 yards, and two touchdowns in that big win over Central Missouri. We thought he deserved it. And then here, Seneca Bradley from Missouri S&T, maybe a squad the minors. We don't talk about nearly as much as we should. Six tackles, two sacks, three and a half TFLs, and a fumble, forced fumble and fumble recovery. Excuse me. On the special team side, how about Khalil Eason from New Haven, listed as an athlete on their roster? Seems to be pretty accurate. Four kick returns for 231 yards and two touchdowns for the Chargers this weekend. That's the D2 side of it. Going up to Division Three, we had co-offensive players of the week, the first of which being Deion Anderson, the wide receiver from Alfred, had 10 catches for 279 yards and three touchdowns. Wow. But this man we'll talk about a lot later on, Aaron Syverson, 34 for 38, almost surgical and perfect through the air, 324 yards and three touchdowns. He was a big reason in that win over Wartburg as well, the quarterback there for the Johnnies. But on the defensive side, linebacker Colton Colucci, 20 tackles for the Algany linebacker, two and a half sacks and a fumble recovery in their game this weekend. And finally, Nicholas Masaragil. I'm going to just go ahead and bow out on that one. Whoever you are, Nicholas, you had a hell of a game. Three kicker turns, 120 yards, brought one of those back for six. So shout out to those guys. Finally, the NAIA side, we've got Kelly Watson, Keely Watson, excuse me, uh, from St. Thomas and their big win over St. Xavier, who I watched a good bit of that one. 23 for 31, 258 yards and five touchdowns for the signal caller down there. How about Treen Davis Reed, the linebacker from Midland? Big time stat line against Morningside, I do believe, this week. And then Arturo Lopez, the punter from Campbellsville, who put up some pretty impressive numbers in his showing this weekend. But that's it for this episode. You can watch on YouTube. If you are, don't forget about the timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the screen. Fast forward to any part of the conversation. Maybe you want to listen about a certain team, certain level of football. Fast forward. Get the hell out of here. Otherwise, I don't know. Just a thought. Maybe just stick around. Maybe stick around and listen. You're in for the long haul tonight. This is a long episode. That means it's a goodie. So stick around. I appreciate you guys tuning in. If you're listening, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever, check those timestamps in the description and fast forward to any part of the episode. But before any of that, get to our first guest of the night from Moorhead, Brady Perriman. <laughs> Joining the show tonight, Saturday, we'll go back. Nine grabs, over 100 yards, three touchdowns, not to mention the game-winning two-point conversion. The Bulldog slaying Dragon himself, Brady Perriman. What's up, man? I'm chilling. How about you? How are you? Dude, chilling is a great way to describe it. Great Monday night here after um, what has been arguably one of the craziest weekends of D2 football. We made our uh, game of the week selections, and you guys, you had to be on that just because of the crazy finish of your game. But across the board, this weekend has been ridiculous. I'm assuming it's felt very much that way in that building. Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely. I get that, man. I get that. And and just to you know start right from there, PAT was never an option, was it? No, not at all. Uh, one of our <laughs> offensive coordinators, actually, he's also the quarterback's coach. Um, he said, once we score, we're going for two. And we knew, you know, that's what we wanted. We didn't want to play for overtime. We wanted to play for the win. 
Yeah, that's that's the right mindset to have, especially um, you talk about being on the road in a hostile environment like that. One that I know that that's the stat that everyone is talking about right now. The last time you guys beat Duluth, 1999. And yeah. uh, you're getting listening to one of the other interviews that you, that you were in. And he's saying, you know, nobody on the team was alive the last time right. that, that yeah. you guys took down this team. And I actually do think that does a very good job of putting this win into perspective. Uh, and it feels like and we'll, we'll get into it. This is potential has the potential of course to be a kind of a program defining win for you guys oh yeah most definitely you know we have a lot of you know older guys on the team but not that old yet so <laughs> yeah I totally like that. I like that. Just uh, just old enough. Um, and it sounded like I heard you speak on it that uh, a lot of the former players have been reaching out um, to you guys, some of the current guys and the staff. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I got a lot of texts uh, that Saturday, even yesterday. It's still, you know, just former players reaching out, guys that play with my freshman year. So it was a really, really big win, not just for us guys on the roster now, but guys that played before as well. Yeah, and that's awesome, man. It's, it was the first ranked win for Coach Lockway, and it feels like this could be – I kind of talked about a program to find a win for the program, but for him and under his leadership here to come in and have that kind of stamp and, and to show success in, in a profession that is so result-driven, right? Like when you come back and you do a review of a, of a coaching staff or when you change things like that, this is something that he's going to carry with him you know, as long as he's here. What has he brought to this program to help put you guys in this kind of position where you can uh, you know, win a game on this stage? Oh, you know, uh, he really breaks down. It's all about football. You know, we talk a lot about uh, how do you win games without football? And he talks about just the love and the family aspect that we do, that we bring to each other. You know, we're all such a close knit group and we feel like we're all like brothers uh, in sort of aspect way. So. I like that. And, you know, to kind of go off of that, we talked to uh, guys, a few guys on here from Harding. They call that the, the brotherhood over there. And I think that's a term that gets thrown around a lot, right? Family, brotherhood, those are uh, buzzwords, excuse me, all around college football. What do you guys do over there at Moorhead to make them more than buzzwords and really a part of that culture? Uh, we have movie nights uh, every Friday before the okay. games. Uh, during fall camp, we do a ton of small groups. Even during uh, out of season, we have small groups usually once a week. Even in fall camp, it's like probably almost every night that we do small groups. Awesome. So we just split up in random groups and we just, there's deep questions that we talk about just to really get to know more people. That's neat. That's neat. I like that. Yeah, it's we're not going around the ring and talking about our favorite color or movie growing up or things like right, that. Right, exactly, yeah. But, um, you know, speaking of guys that have that have positively impacted this program, I mean, we'll talk about you, obviously, but the guy under center for you guys, Jack, he throws for 400 yards again, and what feels like we've come to expect from him and you and, and this offense in general, how has he continued to grow into that role as just being a playmaker for you guys and someone that everyone can depend on over there? You know, he, he's such a great leader for us. You know, he's a real down-to-earth guy. You know, he's always wanting to get better, always looking to push the guy next to him to get better as well. So he just does a great job at leading the team. Uh, you know, we all trust him to make plays, and that's just what makes him such a good player at the end, at the end of the day. And what's something that you've learned playing with him that has helped you guys connect on some of those balls, and especially in those moments where uh, I think it's somewhere, I believe it's like the Marines or the Army, where we talk about, like, we it's not we I'm not a part of it but they they talk <laughs> yeah. about uh you know you don't rise to the occasion you sink to your training right and that's like uh, people love to make the comparison to mill from military to football all the time and there's obviously some some similarities there but in that sense game on the line you guys decide for go for two and he's going to go to the guy that he's most comfortable with being you uh, you talked about the adjustment the outside leverage going for that that quick hitting inside route what's something you've learned playing with him that has made those moments a lot easier uh, I just say the repetition, you know, all the time during summer, you know, we lift early in the morning, we have work, and then he's always he's always willing to text me, you know, Brady, you trying to come to the field after work. You know, it's a long day. You just finished eight hour, eight hour shift. And he's always willing to yeah. stay stay after and throw. So I feel like it's the repetition always. He's always trying to get better as craft and just his timing is always, always there. So I feel like that's what he's a great leader at as well, too. That's good. It's uh, a little better than just catching off the old jugs. Right, yeah. It comes off the hand. Yeah, that's, that's big time. Now, let's talk about you a little bit. Third leading receiver last year, which I think is obviously no discredit to you. You've got some talented guys around you in that offense. But what I think it actually more importantly shows is your guys' ability to spread the ball around. And you have a talented quarterback, that helps. But 
you still need to have some talented guys on the outside. Uh, you guys did a very good job of that last year. I'm sure we'll see a lot in the same this year. But you specifically, what kind of jump are you expecting to see from yourself this year going into maybe a different role? Feels like you've become a priority red zone target this first two weeks. Is that something you hope to continue? Uh, yeah, I hope so. Um, just something I feel like I've grown more as a uh, leader aspect. Um, you know, I'm kind of going into my older years now here. So I'm just trying to connect back with everybody and just being a better leader and helping everybody throughout the team, not just in the position group, but everyone on the team as well. And I kind of told you before we got going, but like people like to talk about you guys pass the ball. Like you do not run the ball. That's just not no. a part of the offense over there. And from a quarterback perspective, a wide receiver perspective, it's easy to buy into that. You know, you're selling a recruit like, hey, we're going to throw the ball 50, 60 times a game. Like it's really easy to get kids riled up for that. Now, on the other side of things, how do you get an offensive line group and a running back group in the offensive backfield? How do you get them to buy into that going into a game and knowing their responsibility? And they still obviously play pivotal roles, but their role is very different on this roster than, say, some of the others across the NSIC. Uh, you know, Lockway talks about it. You know, everyone has a role. You know, everyone knows what we like to do here. So they're all built in on what we what we like to do so you know they're going to play their part just as much as we're going to play our part and they do it all very very well you are correct in that one for sure and you know, speaking on the o-line more specifically um yeah obviously i didn't play the position but i know enough ball to know that you're playing o-line and this guy coming off the edge at you he knows he can just dial up a pass rush snap after snap after snap at some points throughout the game that shit would get old very oh quickly. yeah for right? sure for sure <laughs> exactly we just definitely like, gotta hey, give them credit for sure yeah so at some point you know it, for the offensive line it makes their life i'm sure a bit harder at some points what do you guys do to maybe keep them on their their toe was on the other side of the ball there you know we're just always just encouraging them you know anytime I get the chance you know I always tell them you know this drive starts with you guys we wouldn't be here without you guys so it's really all down to you guys and how we play it the rest of the game so fair enough do you do anything uh when it comes to the snap counts or any kind of I mean it's only week two so we haven't emptied the bag of tricks yet I can assume but anything when it comes to uh trigger wise keep those guys off balance and, and making them kind of hopefully react in the defensive line a little bit rather than just predicting yeah, we definitely have, have a few snap counts that we go off of. You know, we're a no-huddle team, so we're always yeah. getting hand signals. So we just like to keep teams guessing. I like it. I like it. How long before we get the uh, the communications in the helmet here at D2? What do you think? What's your Ooh. guess? I'm thinking of a little while still. Yeah, you think so? Hopefully, hopefully sooner than later, but I still think it's – we still got yeah it'd be a lot to ask for for schools to be able to supply that the fact it's made it down to college football at all now is is quite ridiculous but yeah um no that's that would be ridiculous i mean it'd be awesome for your guys kind of style of offense to be able to relay right. plays like that um yeah. although it is i feel like it's just part of the game and the gamesmanship of the the signals and having the multiple guys and the decoys and all that deal that's obviously been put at the forefront the last yeah. year now but this week back in the road at McKendry, how do you get these guys dialed in after what was a really big, pivotal, some would say an emotional win, the highest of highs? How do you bring them back down to, uh, you know, to that base level, get them dialed in? Oh, you know, it's a 24-hour rule. You know, the games in the past, you can take the highs and the lows from the game. You just got to keep moving forward. You know, we can't live too much in the past. We just got to think more about the future. And uh, we're worried about McKendry now this week. So we just got to flush it and move on. Well said, brother. I don't know if you got a, a future in media – politics shit i mean go out on the list but um i really appreciate you joining me tonight brady thank you, thank i'm really excited to, to continue following you guys that was uh that was one i had on that was a fun game to follow along with i mean you go down it was down 15 points with six minutes left in the game right and yeah the, the stupid question would be to say oh did you guys think you were still in it but you and I know on that sideline, you don't. That, that's not a, even a question that comes into some. No, yeah, exactly. The question that yeah. that I'd like to ask though is, in that moment, did you ever catch yourself trying to just slow down and not trying to make things happen too quickly? Because at that moment, you probably feel like we have to go out there now and perform and make something happen now. Only six minutes left. How do you kind of settle in those moments and just you know go back to like we talked about, fall to the to the levels of your training? Oh, uh, you know, we know there is no. Playing football that could get you 15 points. You know, we knew we were going to yeah. have to score. That's just what it came down to, just getting the ball in the end zone. So that's just really what it came down to. So that's what we knew we had to do. Hell yeah. That's a great answer. No play in the game that's worth 15. Not yet. Yeah, yeah. Not yet, at least. Not yet, brother. Brady, thank you very much, man. Have a good rest of your night. Thank you. You too. Thank you for having me. Of course. See ya.
All right, we'll come out of that conversation with Brady. And going into the D2 recap, MSU Moorhead versus number 19 Minnesota Duluth is top of my list. I think we talked about it enough. We're going to move on. That's a big-time win. Obviously, the first win, first-ranked opponent for Coach uh, Lockway there, the first win over UMD since 1999. And we talked about a lot of that stuff, and it can't be overstated. That is such a program-defining, has the opportunity, I should say, to be a program-defining win for that Dragon squad over there. Let's go right down the list. We've got two games that were our Game of the Week selections this week, also for very, very good reason, the first of which being Emporia State that went into the jungle, as they call it, and beat the Pittsburgh State Gorillas, something we have just not seen a lot from Pittsburgh State playing in their home venue. And this one, I mean, we're going to talk quite a bit about it because this game was absurd. Emporia State certainly showed out in this one. So at the start of the contest, excuse me as I get that full screen, shout out to uh, KOAM Channel 7 there for the great footage on this one. In the start here, Emporia State, only three points in the first quarter. They go into halftime, though, up 17-7, to and a big reason for that, we've talked a little bit about Gunnar Gundy. He was 26 for 40 on the night, 217 and two touchdowns. His number one target, though, right there, Tyler Common, he had eight catches for 129 yards and two touchdowns. You're going to see a lot of those connections from those guys. And then uh, Pittsburgh State did have some things going, would have a touchdown early on, and you're seeing you're see a couple highlights from the Gorillas there. Here's a field goal attempt that I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was wide, and I would be correct in saying that. They were missing their starting kicker, kicker, excuse me, down in Pittsburgh State. That seemed to be a big piece of this one. Another deep ball, this time back in the end zone. Common got that one. He had himself a night. I talked about it already a little bit. We'll keep rolling with it. And you go into halftime, ESU, 17-7, 17-7, to no points scored in the third quarter from either team. Defense is pretty dialed in in the fourth quarter. Some more scoring happens. Emporia State ends up taking this one. They went up 24-14 with five minutes to go in the game, and uh, that would be shaken a little bit, three and a half minutes. Dodson throws a pass to Jack Roberts for the uh, the touchdown, excuse me. So they brought it within a three-point game, but just could not capitalize to close things off. It looks like their last possession, they turned the ball over on downs uh, after four plays. So a great stop by the Emporia defense to shut down Pittsburgh State. And uh, that's a, a game that is really could be, we talk about program-defining wins for Emporia State. They've been a team that's been on that middle to upper echelon of the MIAA. That is a statement win for the Hornets. A very impressive one at that. So down goes number four, Pittsburgh State. Let's talk about number two, Central Missouri on the road at Central Oklahoma. This one was a, I don't know, every adjective in the book. I think shootout is is a great way to describe it just because of the offensive nature of this one. I'll get some highlights up here as I talk about it. Railing Harlem, Harlem Hill winner, excuse me, Zach Zabrowski getting things going for Central Missouri. But uh, that defense from UCO early on, man, they were doing some, some absolute damage. And I think... The crazy thing is, no one's been able to limit Zabrowski there. They've had some success defensively. No one's been able to limit his stat lines. And uh, in a loss, they scored 40 points. He was 27 of 55, 437, and six touchdowns on the day. One interception, big time takeaway from the Bronchos there. And for Zabrowski, 27 of 55 is not the best passing completion percentage for him in his career. We know that. But the fact that he still has the confidence to keep slinging that thing, that's one of a couple sacks. On the night, they actually got to Zabrowski six times. That Broncho defense, that's a big-time uh, stat there for UCO. The man of the hour, and there's a couple of them, but Jet Huff, that's one of the names you definitely want to talk about, the quarterback for Central Oklahoma. 42 for 54, 457, three touchdowns, didn't have an interception. How about the new fountain in their stadium? Did you guys see that back there? I think it's pretty badass. Here is Huff under center right now, or in his shotgun, I should say, handing the ball off. They got things going, that offense. Uh, Jalen Gattrell, 20 carries, 167 yards, 163, excuse me, three touchdowns. And then through the air, Terrell Davis, 14 catches. We talked about him earlier, our player of the week. UCO, man. I mean, just a really, really standout performance from this squad. They have four different guys go ahead and register sacks, had the interception from David Williams there. And when you look at the box score and the breakdown of this one, for a game that finished 57 to 40, there was no scoring in the first quarter. It was 0-0. Zero to zero. You notice we haven't even seen a touchdown yet, and we're getting to this point in the tape, which is pretty wild. That is going to change 
rather soon here as they start to find their rhythm offensively. UCO, 20 point, 22 points they scored in the second quarter alone. UCM scored 20 of their own, that being just a near miss. And I'll try and get forward to uh, some of the highlights here so I can show you some of these scoring plays. Let's see here. The first touchdown of which coming here on this next play. Under center here is Huff. Takes the shotgun, rather, and the handoff to the right side. That one's going short. I'm trying to find it. It's the touchdowns around here somewhere. Bear with me here as I kind of scrub through a little bit of the film. But you talk about how big of a win this is for UCO. Another team like Emporia that has been – there's the touchdown right there. That is a beautiful finish after the catch. The yak yards were awesome there. Um, but talk about a team like UCO that has struggled to break that top level of the MIAA, a win like this certainly could put you over the edge and do a lot of really big things for your program. So a very exciting win for them. Uh, you move forward and try and find, let's see here, the next touchdown for the Bronchos here. Once again, Huffner Center here goes to the left side to his man down the sideline. Just one of his three scores on the night for Davis. You love to see that. Had a little bit of a a little bit of a dance and Selly in the end zone. We absolutely love to see it. I'm definitely not one of those guys that's like, you know, act like you've been there before. Shit. This UCO team has not been there before. They have not won a game like this in quite a long time. So I'm all for these guys getting after it and celebrating in that fashion. Here's one more score before we turn off the tape and check out another game. This one, a little bit more of a deep ball down the seam. Great pitch and catch. Stride it out. Touchdown. For the Broncho. So again, big time win for them. Love the shrug afterwards in the end zone. His performance was quite legendary and uh, a lot of question marks now in the MIAA. A lot of question marks. We're not even done talking about the conference and, and what is going on in that conference right now. And looking forward for UCO, you're at Nebraska hearing this next week and then back at home versus Fort Hayes. Man, Things don't get a lot easier for you in this conference. But uh, I, I would say this is probably the best conference in Division II football right now, the MIAA. The way things are shaking out, to have these top five teams get beat by teams that are lower in the conference, you don't see that parity in other conferences anywhere. And I think this is a really special time to be a part of that conference. Here is a look at uh, the post-game celebration from... The Bronchos down there in central Oklahoma, and rightfully so. The guys were, uh, were definitely getting after it. But, yeah, I mean, the MIAA right now is the best conference in Division II football. The NSIC has a lot of depth. I know we talk about the GLIAC being one of those top-tier conferences. Certainly still the case. The Gulf South you can make an argument for. The MIAA right now, the depth is unmatched in this conference. There are so many teams playing at a high level that it's very impressive. But let's move over. As I take a, a quick breath here and try and, and regain my breath, I know I talk very fast in this. It's literally, literally just because I'm excited about this football. But let's talk about a game that, in all honesty, I had no intention of talking about and did not think I would be talking about um, this week. Northwood, they take back the axe in the game that uh, definitely surprised a lot of people, myself included, this week. They take down Saginaw Valley State in what was... Uh, not the best game in the world if you're a big fan of offensive football. You see an early score from Saginaw Valley. That would be the only one for Saginaw on the day, and it happened in the first quarter. Another deep ball here. That one, though, to the defense. Northwood takes it away. That was a part of the reason they were able to stop Saginaw. They score in the second quarter. This one went into halftime 7-7. Seven to seven. You see the touchdown there for the Timberwolves. They kicked a field goal in the third quarter. That would be the end of the scoring for the entire game. Northwood picks up the win over Saginaw Valley. The first time since the last five meetings this program, they compete for what's literally the Axe Trophy, which is pretty badass in itself. And Northwood finally has a chance to paint that sucker baby blue for the first time in a long time. Saginaw coming off a big win over Winona State was not expecting this result at all shout out to Northwood got things done when you look offensively at this and we're going to talk about it third down efficiency for these two squads at an all-time low Northwood 2 of 14 on third down Saginaw 3 of 17 a big reason right there, getting to the quarterback. That's a big part of Northwood's game in this one. Coach B and company, very happy over there. There's the axe right there. The fellas get the chance to hoist that thing. Not a lot of Northwood teams have been able to do that in recent history. So really excited for those guys to be able to go on a run and, and do that. They certainly, it feels like they got a different energy around this squad over there right now. Now, 
this was the uh, here's a better look at the axe here on from the Northwood Twitter. Shout out to those guys. And potentially, let's see here. The best response to this graphic featuring the axe coming from Northwood Strength and Conditioning. <laughs> Where do people find this shit? The Cardinal looks like he's being dramatic as hell. I don't know if he's actually dead or not, but the message comes across very clearly. I love this. I love the pettiness of this. Um, and, and Northwood's been holding on to that photo for quite a long time. I love the fact that we're finally able to use that. Shout out to Timberwolves and company over there. Excited to be able to talk about those guys. But let's keep it moving uh, to Northwood's opponent next week, I do believe, in Tiffin. They went on the road and played at number eight, Lenore Ryan. They found out why it's so difficult to play in the Bears' den. I, I don't know if that's like technically what they call it. I'm going to start calling it from here on out. I'm not going to claim that I made it up or anything. They probably do call it that over there. But Lenore Ryan, I mean, they looked dominant in this one. Their defense, I guess specifically, looked really, really strong. Uh, we'll take a look here at some of the plays from that Lenore Ryan offense, though, that got this thing going, starting it off here with their first score of the night coming on the ground against the Dragons. This one, Lenore Ryan takes 38-17. to 17. They led 28-10 to 10 at halftime, and that thing just carried on into the second half. Now, I talk about their offense. Their defense stepped up in a big way. They did a lot uh, in this one. They had two interceptions on the night. One of those was returned for a touchdown, which was big time for them. But they also made a lot of plays in the backfield. They had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different guys register TFL. So making a lot of plays behind the line of scrimmage. JT Black had a big time fumble recovery return. You had two different guys with interceptions. Chris Brown took one 68 yards to the house. We posted those on the Twitter, I believe, the day of. See, Tiffin early on does rep uh, respond, excuse me, with that score. And it felt like things maybe could, by the way, side note, look at this atmosphere. Everyone's sitting on the wall right there. This stadium has to be one of the best in Division Two. The atmosphere looks incredible. I love just the look and feel of this stadium. The big high wall separating the field from the rest of everything they've got going on over there. But man, this uh, Lenore defense led still on the inside by Andre Jefferson. We've talked about quite a bit on this program. They had a lot going on for them. Jalen Ferguson, 16-27, 148, three touchdowns through the air. Not bad. We've come to expect a lot from Xavion Turner Knox in the backfield. He had a decent day, 65 yards, still average over three a carry. Not terrible. Not what we've come to expect, though. Receiving core did some good things, but I think the highlight of this, Lenore Ryan, their defensive takeaways, being able to score the ball defensively, and their special teams play. I mean, when you have uh, guys that can return things like that and uh, and go and do pieces on the special teams. I'm trying to remember. I believe they had... Not a, maybe not a return to this one, but the, just big special teams play in general. Here's the interception return right there. This game should not have been as much of a blowout as it was. Tiffin is a very quality opponent. That just goes to show the level at which this Lenore Ryan defense is playing. Right now, they're playing at a very good clip. They're going to be really hard to stop moving down the line. But let's keep moving down the line when it comes to us talking about D2 football games. This is a game that I got to watch almost the entirety of, that being number three, GVSU, going into number 22, Colorado State Pueblo in the Thunder Bowl. This is one where I thought maybe the Lakers should potentially be on upset watch. This CSU Pueblo team, we have seen a lot about them uh, early on here. They go and beat the crap out of UTPB. They played some really good football even the week prior. And uh, this, the first half at least, was all Lakers. You saw the sack there early on. The Lakers drive down the field. Their rushing attack got going in this one, man. It felt like uh, the Lakers could kind of take off with this. Credit to CSUP, man. They took this one back in the second half, made this thing a little bit more competitive. And by a little bit, I mean a lot more competitive. GVSU going into halftime, up 17 to nothing. Again, felt like this was a player two away from really being busted open. And when you look back at this, the initial drive from Pueblo, right, they go down the field, seven plays, 53 yards. Instead of kicking the field goal, getting guaranteed three points, they end up to elect to go for it on fourth down. They do not get it. They turn the ball over, and that felt like kind of a pivotal point for the CSU Pueblo offense. They go three and out on the next possession. Then the next possession after that, nine plays, 62 yards, ends in a fumble. Then the next possession after that, seven plays, 54 yards, putting things together, ends in an interception. So GVSU, credit to them, making timely plays, bend, don't break. See the anchor there uh, from Grand Valley. They take this one. And again, it's just, it felt like some really untimely moments from CSU Pueblo. GV, 
ekes it out. Three-point win, 24-21. The game wasn't quite that close. CSU Pueblo put up uh, a couple more points in the end to make it look a little more interesting. Shout out the Powder Blues, by the way, from CSU Pueblo. Those jerseys are beautiful. The only thing more beautiful than that then was uh, Grand Valley's running game. They ran the rock pretty damn well. They finished with 249 yards on the day compared to Pueblo's 69. This GVSU team, you saw it in my tweet. I mean, they're going to be a national contender. I don't think there's any doubt about that. We've known that from this Lakers squad. To go into uh, a top-ranked opponent like that and have that result and really a game that could have been even more blown open, I was very impressed with. But let's keep things moving. We've got another top-five team to talk about. This one was also on upset watch, but this team ended up taking it anyways. We're talking about Colorado School of Mines taking on Washburn, the Ore Diggers, number five in the country. Washburn, another MIAA team, putting some teams on upset notice this week. You'll see here, Washburn gets things going early, back right corner of the end zone. Great grab, hauling that one in. You get the box score here. It was tied up at seven after the first. Mines took a slim three-point lead heading into halftime. Both teams would score one touchdown apiece in the second half, and Mines wins this one 31 to 28 on the road. I mean, this is a really back and forth game. I don't think there was a, a Deficit of more than 10 points anywhere throughout it. Washburn strikes first. We saw the touchdown. Uh, Mines would strike back. Landon Walker has just proven to be an absolute dog for this Ordigger offense. He had a 75-yarder touchdown run. He finished with 142 on the day and four touchdowns for the running back out of Mines. But again, Washburn puts him on the ropes, not able to finish the job. Mines, we know, is still a very good football team. A lot of people are holding the last two national championship appearances against them. I totally understand why. I've been in that boat a little bit. But uh, when you look at what they're able to do after losing Matoka and company and a lot of those guys, Evan Foster, 24 for 30 through the air, 255 yards, no touchdowns through the air. That was Landon Walker territory anytime they got into the red zone. But... Oh, boy. A lot of great football being played. I've got two more games I want to talk about before we move on. The first of which being a team that we haven't talked about a lot on this program. Minot State, the Beavers, who are playing some really good quality football right now. They play against Northern State to open up their Northern Sun Conference play, I do believe. Northern State, you see there, back right corner of the end zone. They get things started and strike first touchdown wise in this one Minot State did have a field goal before that but the triple option for the Beavers took a little while to get warmed up they ended up scoring more in the second half this was a low scoring affair the Beavers win 17 to 14 and uh, this is a Beaver squad that was 1 in 10 last year this is their first time going 3 and 0 in more than 20 years first time going 3 and 0 since moving to division 2 I mean as far back as their records go this team has never been 3 and 0 at the division 2 level so the Beaver squad has a lot going for them right now it feels like the energy around this program is at an all time high watching the triple option maybe bore the hell out of northern state and end up striking and gashing in the second half feels like exactly how this offense was intended to work the green uniforms the beavers they get it done 17-14 against Northern State at home. And glad we get to talk about some new teams on this show. I like that we have different teams having success. Let's close it out. We talked about upsets. I promise there's one more for you. We're going to be talking about the Bulldogs. We're going to be talking about the Statesman. Wingate takes down number 17, Delta State, in an SAC Gulf South type matchup, 21 to 7. The Bulldogs take this one home. They go into halftime, 14 7 lead, and score once more and kind of put this game away, man. They put it on ice. You see Delta State here actually led things off with the touchdown. They would not score the rest of the night. Delta State attempted 26 passes. They finished with only 100 yards through the air and an interception. The Wingate defense was doing all their work and then some. Offensively, not a great game for either side. For Wingate, though, when you look at these numbers, let's see here. 14 TFLs for this Bulldog defense. That's a ridiculous number. Five of those being sacks. Had an interception. Bunch of PBUs. A lot of back quarterback hurries. Uh, Marquise Fleming is a name that I, we've talked about for this Wingate squad. One of their best, if not the best, defensive player on that roster. He was getting it done. A lot of other pieces on that Wingate side were getting it done. The Wingate defense stepped up big time in this one. To hold the Delta State offense that we've seen had some really explosive firepower. And I know Shegog is no longer under center for the Statesman. That does not mean this offense has been diminished. They still have a lot of firepower. So I don't want to take anything away from Wingate. 
Wingate. That is a very quality win for the team out of the sack. But that's kind of the, the big notes from me for D2. We will move over and get to our second guest conversation of the day with Hayden before we move over to D3 and NAI. Also joining the show tonight, key contributor in St. John's massive win on Saturday, causing havoc in a backfield near you, Hayden Sanders. What's up, man? How's it going? Dude, I'm excited to talk to you um, about this game. And before we talk about anything else, 10 sacks I thought was a typo. I was corrected almost immediately. That number is a number I have not seen in quite a long time. What the hell? Yeah. No, it just speaks volumes to the, the team that we have, the, the defensive front, front seven, the squad that we have. And, I mean, I've been telling the guys this for a long time now, but um, from top to bottom, this team is just complete. Um, and you specifically the defensive unit, there are so many guys that can play. And I, I tell them this too, I can play so aggressive um, for uh, for whatever reason, maybe I'm not not in the game. I, I know I got guys who can play who are behind me. And it just speaks testament to the, to the team that we got. That's what you want, man. The next man up, and you're confident in the guy that's that's coming in to do your job, especially defensively, right? And I think that's something that a lot of the great teams have is the depth, uh, especially in that front seven where you see there are guys in that front four, that back, whatever, depending on the system and the kind of the you know what you're running over there. But those guys that can rotate in and the level doesn't drop off, right? This like right. not one to two, it's like a one A, one B type situation where you feel confident those guys can go in and play really meaningful snaps. Great to hear. It sounds like it's what you guys got going on there. Talk to me about this game, just general reactions from this on Saturday before we dive into it. Yeah, well, um, it was a statement game for us. We wanted, um, with the season, not make the playoffs last year. Yep. We had to kind of create identity for this team, um, both offensively and defensively, right? And uh, first game, a shutout is always good, but we knew playing um, a ranked opponent, number five, Warburg, would really put us somewhere um, on that list. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you there. And you, and you took care of business, for sure. I mean, that's why we're here talking, because you guys did that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you come off a of week one where you guys just had your way kind of doing, I want to say, whatever you wanted. But whatever you wanted, I get to say that. You don't. I, you got who did whatever you wanted in that, in that week one, and now you come into this one, you knew what that matchup kind of entailed. What was the buildup around it externally? Internally, I'm sure you guys take care of your business. You're a team that's experienced success. You know not to overlook anyone or to make anything too big out of it. Externally, outside of that building, out of that locker room, what was the buildup to this weekend like? Yeah, well, we knew Warburg was obviously a great team, right? And, you know, we, we played them in 2022, and – um, they sent they sent us home on our home field, right? So it was one of those things where um, it's a little personal, and it's kind of funny because that's a team that you really respect, right? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of hard to to manage. Hey, this this is a team that sent us home, and you're playing them, and it's like these are these are great guys, nice guys, but at the end of the day, you really have to hang your hat on something. For us, it was stopping the run game and having a dominant defense, and on the other side of the ball, offense. You know, Aaron had a spectacular, phenomenal game. Um, we called it his revenge game as well because. I like it. Um, he wasn't wasn't happy with his performance in 2022, and boy, did he he ball out uh, on Saturday. Yeah, and the, these programs between you and Warburg have only met six times. The first game was in 1970. That's a ridiculous stat for you today. Uh, but mm. you know, talking about going back to this game, not the game that took place fifty uh, some years ago. You specifically, you talked about playing aggressive, right? And you did that. Ten tackles, four of them behind the line of scrimmage. You're playing free out there. Were you sniffing out play calls? Were you peeking at the signals? You had a little cheat sheet on the arm sleeve? Or it was more of just the trust in the guys around you and playing free, I'm sure, is is more along the lines of the real answer, but I like to imagine. Yeah, we have two things with that. One, at St. John's, we have a coaching staff that's second to none, right? They're going to prepare you very well. Um, It's just a matter if we can execute. Um, And with that, the guys that we have as well, I told you our depth, but um, I was telling my roommate, Zach Frank, who also had two and a half sacks. Mm-hmm. Is, I had no crazy pass rush this game. You know, <laughs> even watching film today, it was like, uh, there's a lot I need to improve on and, and, and will improve on. But um, those guys made it easy for me. And if you look at that box score, it's not just me. We're, it's littered. Oh, yeah. You know, those top four, top five guys, I mean, if not all the way down to the bottom, really made it easy on each other. And even with that, it's like you can't game plan for one person. And that's kind of the spot that we're at right now. And I just love the position that we're in that's beneficial to everyone in that defensive front. It's like it's like the same thing as having a bunch of wide receivers that are all dangerous. You can't double one. You, you, you can't du- or you can't yeah, you can't double one because then the others are going to go make plays. They can't single out right. one of the guys coming off the edge because then, 
you know, you might want to watch your back. But um, talking about this game, what was the game plan heading into this? Was this kind of a game you guys identified? Maybe some quote unquote weaknesses from this Warburg front you tried to expose? And uh, did you have any inkling of the kind of defensive success you were going to have going into this one? Yeah, well, we knew we had to stop the run, and that's what Warburg hangs their hat on. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I know the team that we have and, and the guys that we get, and again, that depth and you have guys who can make them step up in the pocket, make you look a little bit better than you may be, right? Um, but no, yeah, just executing every everything that we had, every game plan. And um, I, I think individually, there was one of those things where um, you can look and see not necessarily their weakness, but but it was just a man-on-man matchup. And and you knew that it was going to be four quarters of, you know, smacking heads. And oh, yeah. That, that's essentially what it was. And hang your hat on that. A hundred percent. I think that's a good way of, of describing it. I like that a yeah. lot. And, and you had mentioned earlier, I mean, missing out on last year's playoffs. And that's something that sticks with you guys, obviously. And, uh, you know, sitting your couch in, in November and watching other teams play is something that is like not very easy to get over. But is on the other side of things, a great motivator for the guys who have more years to come back, guys in your shoes who can come back and give this thing another go. But this has to be Captain Obvious here, a great confidence boost for you guys moving forward, not just because it's a quality win, but now it has to feel like, in a sense, that you guys control your own destiny. And that's where the D3 playoffs, they've come under a lot of fire for these teams that, you know, outside of the automatic bids, man, it is tough to crack that bracket. And so now for you guys with these two wins out of the way, one of them against, I mean, some of the best competition in all the country, there has to be a great sense of we control exactly where we're going from here on out. Is that the general sentiment? Absolutely. And just establishing that identity as a team, whether that's offensively and defensively, we've um, shown that we can compete with the teams, if not, um, you know, hold our own and dominate you know, in yeah. a sense. Right. So we just got to keep getting better um, game by game and uh, keep our focus on what's in front of us uh, just one game at a time. But yeah. We saw uh, NIU take down Notre Dame, and you'll get where I'm going with this in a second. Don't worry. But uh, Coach Hammock, he tells Marcus Freeman that after the game, he's like, hey, Coach, uh, you know, if you want to know, like, what the scout was, or, you know, just some things that we identified weakness-wise, I'd be more than happy to share. Not something we see a whole lot at any high-level athletics. I think probably more of a pride thing. Talk about what the scout was for Wartburg, if you're willing to share, now that we're looking back at it retroactively and some of the things you identify with them, good, bad, indifferent, otherwise. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I saw that, too, and that was, it was an interesting was, thing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I really like observing coaching styles and leadership styles and things like that. And I mean, you want to be a guy like that, right? You want to be around guys like that. Um, but more so to our point in the game, it was – I think we just played with a, a high level of enthusiasm, right? And that was something that we kind of got – into at the, the, the late sense of um, of the uh, the end of last year, and we finally tapped into who we are. We had a lot of guys stay up for the summer, and this is a really close knit uh, team. The team cohesion is at an all time high, so you're really playing football for each other. And I, you know, I sent out a text to the guys where um, uh, just the, the Friday night for that like Morper game just saying that, hey, I wouldn't want it any other way. And I really appreciate the guys and how proud I am of them and, and to be along this journey with them. And oh, yeah. if that means that we had to miss playoffs last year to be where we are today, then so be it. Wouldn't want to be um, anywhere else with any other team. And this team is no stranger to, quote-unquote, tough starts of the year and talking about non-conference schedules, right? You look back just a year ago, and you start with Trinity, Texas, and Whitewater, just two gauntlets, two incredible offenses off the rip. From a defensive standpoint, those are two very tall tacks. And now, what does that do to prepare a team like you guys for the rest of the year, getting some of that, uh, some of that stuff off the bat in the first couple of weeks? Yes, yeah, so that, that was Final Four, four team, Final Four game playoff game so that bar's heightened for us right now we know what it takes what it what it looks like to play playoff football um not to say that we we don't know what it takes but uh we, we've seen it early on and with, with the new guys that that are in new roles they've seen it now and um it was just a fast physical game and yeah. uh as long as you can see it now that bar is heightened and um, just moving forward with that and to close it off, man, I mean, you guys, you don't get a break. On the road at Bethel this week to open up conference play against, you know, what is, some would say, the measuring stick in that conference. What have you uh, seen from that, and what are you prepping for this uh, this coming weekend? Yeah, so um, right now, we're, it's, a, it's a bye this week. Next oh, week it is a bye. Yeah. 
yeah. and then we got a little, them, little so too got quick two. on the a little too quick on the look. Yeah, right. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. You got yeah, another so we. week then so to we. prep. That's good. <laughs> yeah, we got a week to prep for the Royals. Yeah. So talk about what you're looking forward to to that one. The the opponent is still there. We just got a few more days to game plan, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there two weeks go. for that. And uh, Bethel's always a solid opponent. Um, one of our tougher conference matchups, and um, I, you know we assume the role um, in, in the the attitude of our defensive coordinator, at least as a defensive unit, right? And we're just trying to play uh, just stalwart defense where it's, it's uh, again, you're creating an identity brand where you can look back and say, hey, that, that was a dominant defense. And when we look forward to Bethel, it, it, it doesn't change for them as well. So, um, you know, it should be a great game preparing for – hopefully they um, establish the run game as well so we can match up very well with that. Uh, um, look forward to that. I love it. I love it, Hayden. You're the man. Long day, meetings, classes. He sacks the quarterback. I'm assuming you're doing good in the classroom, and what are the grades like? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We took yeah. care of his. I got that impression early on, but uh, the man does it all. I really appreciate you uh, spending some of your time with me here tonight, brother, and I'm looking forward to it. Not this weekend, but the following to continue to follow along uh, with you guys in, in that matchup down there in the MIAC. So thank you very much, man. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yep. Have a good night. All right, let's switch over to Division Three. We have the top-ranked Cardinals from North Central playing host, or sorry, on the road at number 13 Aurora, a game that uh, I think many were expecting to be a lot more competitive than the, uh, the end result here to chat with me about it, Jimmy Martin. Jimmy, this one, Cardinals going to do what the Cardinals do. Sacco, Lanin, the boys were just clicking on all cylinders. Yeah, I was waiting for the introduction. Usually you do it right at the beginning. I'm like, oh, yeah. I have it myself. <laughs> Forgot about no, you. No, but uh, on my notes, I just have Sacco going to Sacco. I mean, you just give that kid the ball. He's going to he's gonna score. He's going to make big plays. So obviously, you got Luke Lanning, too. Um, man, North Central is just a wagon. But I will say, though, you know, Aurora, they did st- still score 21 points against this really, really, really good North Central defense. And uh, I expect Aurora to bounce back off this one. I mean, you know, it's always, it's always tough losing, like, a big game like that especially a rivalry game, uh, in-state, everything. But uh, BB will have the boys ready to go. I mean, the Spartans aren't going anywhere. They're going to be – I don't see them losing another game the rest of the year. I mean, I, got, I have to look at their schedule again, but, I mean, they don't, their, their conference isn't too tough, and obviously they're just a really good football team as well. So I expect them to roll the rest of the way and then uh, <clears throat> hopefully do some damage in uh, the playoffs. Who do you think their uh, best competition in conference will be as we look throughout the rest of the year? Mark's telling me Benedictine because, you know, the pro deep coaches are over there at Benedictine. And, uh, you know, they always get a high-powered offense. But, you know, I don't know, man. I that Obviously, that it's a huge rivalry game for them, too, that Aurora Benedictine. So, I'll go with Benedictine for now. But, you know, there could be a lot of different teams that could uh, be in there, too. But that's my pick for now. Yeah, because now you pick up a loss like this early, and we know with uh, the Division three playoff, man, and the at least the current state of the at-large and everything, that could be – that can be tough to rebound from. And now if there's a team that can do it, they're certainly one of those squads that can go out and make that happen. But uh, having a blemish like that uh, early on in the record, even against, I mean, it's literally, at least what from the rankings and everything, the best team in the country, which is what's so crazy about all of it, right? Um, we talk about a blemish in the record. Okay, you didn't beat the best team in the country right yeah. now. Uh, <clears throat> which is, you know, maybe my wording is a little bit faulty there. Um, but yeah, I mean, in this one, going through it, this was a pretty dominant performance for North Central. And I mean, going into halftime here, it was 34 to 7. North Central up and Aurora gets two scores in the second half and I'm showing some of the highlights offensively for the Cardinals they had some takeaways that I think were a big part of their success uh, early on and this one there was another clip that I, I may or may not get up here that was a an interception but it was a very complimentary game for North Central and you look at the the box score lane in incredibly efficient per usable per, per usual excuse me 21 for 31 241 and three tuds no giveaways through the air and the ground game, Joe Sacco finishes with 150 yards on 19 carries. That's uh, that's nice. 146, sorry, net 146. Well, wow, big difference. There. Yeah, I know it. I noticed about like these like D3 and D2 box scores. They have the net and then like the regular yards rather than just like a normal box score doesn't have net or anything. It's just kind of weird. The layout is is a little interesting sometimes. It throws <laughs> me for uh, 
for right. a bit of a loop. But yeah, so that I mean that was a pretty a pretty dominant performance from the Cardinals. We come to expect that from them. And uh, we haven't talked a lot about Cortland this first couple weeks, just because what the hell is there to talk about? They go on and score seventy <laughs> again this week. I mean, we'll just touch on that very briefly, so people don't get upset. Trust me, we're going to talk all about Cortland the further we yeah. get down the road, especially some of the contests they have later on. But man, the first half of their schedule. It's tough. It's yeah. tough out here. Hey, man. We can, hey, they're um, winning games. You can't. They are. And they're, they're doing winning. it how they're supposed to, right? From a <laughs> exactly. team coming off a national championship, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to. No discredit exactly. to them, but, man, it's boring to talk about. That's just all it is. Um, now, uh, let's talk about a game that was much more exciting, that being Co at Wisconsin-Eau Claire. This one, man, back and forth, all the way down to the wire. The Cohawks pull it out. That is such a sick name, by the way. I absolutely love that. What did you see yeah. in this one, dude? So I don't know if you saw this one, but obviously Co went out to a 21 nothing lead early. Yep. 21 and 21 rip. And Eau Claire came firing right back with that high powered offense with Harry Rubidoux. Uh good dude, by the way. I've got to know Harry a little bit uh, over the last couple months. Good guy. Uh six touchdowns for the kid. Um obviously they're falling up a just a little short. You know, it'd have been a very, it was a very effort, like crazy comeback. Uh Eau Claire's tough, man. You know, obviously. Being from Stout, you know, I kind of we kind of look at Claire like, oh, like screw those guys. But no, I like, I turned the game on and I'm like, wow, like they did not go away. Like, you know, they showed their true character and things went, things didn't go well. You know, they fired back. But uh, uh, for Co though, Trent Barnes, 177 yards and three touchdowns. He was definitely the uh, player of the game, so to speak. It might may have gone to Rubidu honestly if uh, Claire would have snuck it out. But uh, yeah, Barnes had a heck of a game for the Cohawks. Yep, you talked about it. Twenty-one nothing start. Eau Claire bounces back, scores fourteen unanswered, and uh, you know coming into the second quarter, they or second half, excuse me, they carry that momentum over and uh, did eventually get things going offensively there. Uh, and you go now into the fourth. It came down to some almost last minute type heroics. It wasn't like a last minute score or anything, but it was more uh, defensively stepping up and forcing the overtime there. And I mean, that's where Co just uh, took it away, man. 43, 41. Definitely. I, I don't know what the heck the over under was. I don't know if we talked about it last week. We probably didn't preview this one too much. This was definitely the over overtime helps in that fashion, but 43, 41 from these two teams. That's, that's a high total. Yeah, and uh, shout out to Mikey Schultz for the live tweets. I know he's uh covers a lot of YX sports, specifically Leo Claire. And he was covering the stock game two weeks, so he does a good job uh, live tweeting. So shout out to Mikey Schultz. He's a good follow on Twitter for D3 football. Love that. Love that. We can uh, move over. Let's talk about a, another overtime matchup. This one, Hobart at Randolph Macon. 14 7. Yellow Jackets come out with this one in a semi surprisingly tight fashion for me. I guess looking just recency bias coming off of a playoff run that they had uh, against a Hobart team that obviously is respectable, but just maybe hasn't demanded that same level of respect as an RMC type of caliber of squad. And. This one, um, the only highlights I've got are from Hobart. So if you're watching, like, don't wonder why it's like just showing the Hobart plays. I figured some video is better than none. But Jimmy, what did we, uh, what did we see in this in this tight win for RMC here? Uh, we saw Randolph Macon having just their defense showing up more than it's ever had before. I mean, you expect them to score more than 14 points, but man, oh man, when you hold the team to seven, especially when you go to overtime. Uh, I think Randolph Macon's going to depend on their defense and their identity a lot this year. But again, you know, obviously their offense could totally bounce back. Uh, I was really surprised this game was this close. Um, some alarm bells might have been going off. And again, I I just think they were they, they took uh they didn't take Hobart seriously enough and uh, came back to bite them. And luckily, they prevailed. Uh, they scored first in overtime, and then Hobart coughed up the ball. Yep, and that was it. So, uh, but I mean, Hobart's tough. Man. That's a uh, it's quite a to go into Randolph Macon, take them to overtime. Uh, Obert might have turned a lot of eyes this week. Especially they definitely should have. Their defense, in particular, obviously, um, going on the road and having that kind of performance, that's what really stands <laughs> out. You do generate a takeaway through the air. Um, Zashawn Dixon had uh, an interception for Hobart. Then a couple guys at the top of the stat sheet here filling it out. Anthony Romano, how about 10 tackles, a sack, two TFLs, and then Mike McGee, eight tackles, sack, two TFLs, and a PBU. I mean, you go out on the list, they were splitting it up. There were, I mean, the, the amount of guys that registered – Four more tackles here. You go two, four, 
And like almost 12 guys that had at least four tackles in this one for Hobart. So it was spread out across the board, everyone making contributions, how it's supposed to be, I guess, technically. But they had some big-time playmakers step up for them. The takeaway was huge. And uh, Randolph-Macon was doing the same. They also had an interception, generated some of those takeaways. Uh, where they really struggled was on the ground. They didn't have a rusher with more than 25 yards on the day, and that's just not something we've come to associate with this squad in particular. Um, the receiving core had two guys over 50 yards apiece with Jason Moore and Landon Ferris, but uh, just not an offensive performance, uh, anything to write home about for either of these squads. And in a gritty game like that, those teams that have maybe the playoff experience and those kind of things are usually the ones that come out on top. Yep. You can always take wins where you can get them. Winning ugly is sweet. Isn't that what they always say? Huh? I like that. I like Winning that. Winning ugly let's, uh, is... Let's go to uh, our final overtime conversation for the day, man. This one, I was definitely tuned into, the ending of which was uh, pretty fantastic, I would say. Not that I was pulling for any specific squad, but... Uh, Number 18, Linfield, goes to number 16, UW Oshkosh. Oshkosh pulls up the 28-21 victory in overtime. This was an exciting game, uh, a lot of big-time plays, and the overtime was really fun to watch. I was able to tune into this one live. Yeah, uh, now we look at it. Oshkosh has the most impressive resume in Division Three. It's okay. two top 25 wins, uh, obviously one being last week against Weed and then this past week against Linfield, uh, two mm -hmm. really, really good football teams. Kyle Dietzen seals the game with a pick in overtime yep. for the Titans. Uh, Justice Lovelace also ran that rock for 130 yards and a touchdown in the victory. Um, I, game winner. Thing, oh, yeah. The only thing I want to see from Oshkosh is, like, the, I want to see them score a little bit more points. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, obviously, against Wheaton, they had 21, and they had 28 last week. With an overtime game, it's like yeah, they want to if they want to start competing in the YI because good as their defense is, they gotta start scoring more points. And I'm sure that's being emphasized in the football offices all week with Oshkosh to get the ball in the end zone and score a little bit more. No, hundred percent. Defense has been score... light. Their defense has been lights out though. I gotta give it to them. That helps. Uh, when you score, they scored once in each quarter. And, you know, you go into halftime with 14 points, most offensive coordinators are going to be okay with that. I mean, a score in each quarter. But, again, when you get to those games, like you said, down the stretch, they've got two monsters out of the way in Linfield and in Wheaton and games that maybe we didn't expect them to come out on top of, but they've had some gritty wins, uh, the first one being much more commanding. But when you go into the games against uh, Whitewater, against Lacrosse, shoot, even against a River Falls, you talk about an offense like that where uh, their defense is obviously going to have to step up, but there might be a case where some of these games could turn into shootouts. in his Oshkosh, prepared to be in that kind of contest or can the defense hold them from being in that kind of contest where it's back and forth offense down the field down the field that will be the ultimate test for them but looking at this one uh for Oshkosh Cole Warren through the air 15 for 19 180 yards two touchdowns just deadly efficient uh nothing too flashy there Justice Levin like you talked about 136 on the ground did have the game winning touchdown didn't have a crazy amount going on through the air just because of the nature of kind of where this game went offensively. Oshkosh defense, to talk about that one takeaway late. And uh, I don't know if there's any, too many other big sticking points on this one. Uh, going through the actual box score, I wanted to take a look at the time of possession. That was the one I was curious at watching this game, kind of getting a feel for that. And, yeah, uh, Oshkosh actually did control the time of possession. Had about almost 32 minutes of uh, holding on to the ball, and that helps. We'll talk about a game later on where teams maybe did not do it that much. Oshkosh only punted once on the day as well, Jimmy. I don't know if you knew that one. Yeah, that just doesn't that's, that doesn't make any sense to me unless they went for it on fourth a few times because typically if you only punt it once, you'd score like 40 points. They tried for fourth down four times, converted okay, that makes on two sense. of the four. That, make, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yep. So 50% uh, like on fourth down. Not awful, and where they were really bad offensively, 4 of 14 on third down for the Titans, and that's a number where we talk about those games later on. If you want to sustain drives, that number has to be better or else they're not going to be able to stay in the game. Yeah, that, that just makes me wonder how many penalties they may have had on first down. Like a lot of, probably a lot of holding, false start, like procedural things. I mean, I, again, I have to look. But typically, if you're not converting a lot on third down, it means you're not doing good on first or second down. So you're setting yourself up with third and long pretty often, which is a recipe for disaster offensively. I mean, Seven yeah. penalties for 55 yards. So, I mean, nothing absurd, but again, seven different penalties. So, obviously, those are some nitpicky things. We saw a couple procedural-type penalties. They are just going to set you back on the chains that are going to be, um, like you said, that could derail an offense in a drive. Yeah. 
Just based on the math, that sounds like four holdings and three false starts. Is like <laughs> maybe. I, I don't know. I could be wrong though. Again, because there could have yeah. been a couple defensive penalties, maybe an offside encroachment. Whatever. Yeah. I mean, the run defense for them was was pretty stellar. Linfield had one rushing first down on the day. Thirteen of their fourteen came through the air. Not recipe for victory. Not no, say. not at all. I mean, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty easy one. But no, I'm very excited. And we talk about now. You talk about the schedule a little bit. We're talking about a team, the Titans, um, that could put together what is potentially the toughest schedule, one of the toughest schedules in the last decade uh, of Division Three football because. Being in the WIAC does that to a certain degree already with a good squad. And then you have the lacrosse, the Whitewater, the River Falls. Shoot, even the Platteville that's sneaking their way into the top 25 type rankings, depending on who you ask here. You add these two quality non-conference opponents, and this team is putting together a 2024 campaign that is quite ridiculous uh, on paper, right? No, as we said earlier, I mean, it's the most impressive resume in Division three at the moment. I mean, you got technically not even top 25, like two top 20 wins. Yeah. Like that, that's quite a way to start the season for sure. It is. Another squad picking up a top 10 win. How about that? We've got St. John's 35 to 13. Fending off Wartburg, a team that uh, we've obviously been very high on. You look at the semifinal match and all the way up until that last year. St. John's, they take care of business at home, Jimmy. Yeah, uh, Wartburg giving up 35 points in a non-conference game was not on my bingo card. Yeah. Uh, I was not anticipating that at all. Uh, St. John's is for real. Man. You, anytime you beat a Wartburg team by 22 points, it's gonna, that's going to turn a lot of heads. Um, Aaron Syverson continues to ball out, 300-plus uh, yards, three touchdowns. Um, he's, he was a stud for them last year, too. I mean, St. John's is just a, they're just a wagon. I, mean, I think they're going to – have a really good year here in uh, probably their probably their toughest game in the regular season. I mean, maybe you got Bethel coming in too, but uh, yeah, the Royals. Man, that's quite a statement win for St. John's. They're definitely going to be talked a lot about on this podcast going forward. And deservedly so. Cyberson has been quite deadly under center for them. He was our, our co-offensive player of the week this week for Division Three, and rightfully so. But their defense, for me, was the were the unsung heroes. I, maybe not unsung because they got their flowers, but uh, they definitely earned them. Ten sacks for that Johnny defense against Wartburg. That is not a number you see often, and that's for good reason because it's really freaking difficult to do. Uh, they yeah. had five different guys register at least one sack. They had... Looks like eight different guys register tackles for loss. And Hayden Sanders, who we will have on here shortly on the podcast, or probably earlier if you're if you're listening to this now, Aiden McMahon, Zach Frank, Cooper Yagi, like these guys, you go out on the list, all of them getting back there into the backfield and making big time plays behind the line of scrimmage. You do not see that at any level of college football. So St. John's defense stepping up big time and uh and it showed. I mean, uh, Warburg through the air still had a really good day. Carter uh, Markham was 23 for 29, 307, and a touchdown. That feels like a winning recipe. But then you realize that with all those stats, they only scored 13 points. And that's because he was uh, he's probably fighting for his life back there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, you can take a lot of sacks, get backed up. I mean, and then also, you got to think if you're throwing for 300 yards and you lose by 22, they probably fell behind or they're throwing the ball a lot. I'm curious to see their red zone percentage for this week. I don't know if you have that up or not. I'm going to click on this. I can, yeah. And talking about the other side of things, uh, in St. John, Syverson was 34 for 38. I mean, that's surgical. Yeah, that's that's ridiculous. Having that four is. incomplete passes. That sounds like a Luke Laney stat line. It does. And he completed for passes sure. to eight different receivers, but Dylan Wheeler was on the receiving end of 12 of those. He finished with 105 yards and led them through the air. When you look at that red zone stat jimmy here um they were one for two i see in the that, red yeah. zone scores and chances there st john's on the other hand wow. five wow. for five wow that is big time um also there st john's seven of 11 on third one of one on fourth warburg third of 12 on third down and a big reason for that one obviously being those sacks and the pressure but when you get the sacks and some of those tfls early on and first and second down get them behind the chains those third and eight third and six third and fours turn into third and 12 third and 15 type of plays and those are just there's not enough plays in the playbook or really any plays in the playbook uh to, to start those off 42 yards they lose on sacks in this one alone 
Jeez. And I am kind of surprised to see the time possession battle was like basically even. 3103 yeah. to 2857. I mean, yeah. That is interesting. Must have had some, I mean, they, they were sustaining drives. I mean, they had the ball for 2857. I mean, mm. sheesh. Let's move over to uh, what became our D3 game of the week, and that being a very surprising one because the one that we just talked about could have rightfully so been that game of the week, the way St. John's came out and dominated that game, and you can make a case for so many games each week, but this one I thought stood above and beyond because of the performance from the DePaul Tigers, number 25 at number 21, Barry. This uh, 33-0, pitching a shutout against the top 25 team in this fashion, your defense stepping up, your offense making plays. I thought this performance warranted our, our game of the week, and it wasn't even something that was on my radar right away, but this was a, a program-defining performance for this DePaul squad. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, it's funny to say it wasn't on your radar because I did my write-up this morning, and I came to look at the <laughs> the document at about I don't know, 7.10, and I saw the DePaul Barry game on there. I'm like, oh, 33 nothing, holy cow. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, in all honesty, that's not something I was expecting whatsoever. Um, on the road, especially winning 30. Yeah. Barry held to yeah. 50 <laughs> yards on 37 rushing attempts in the entirety of this one. And definitely wouldn't say it was uh, an offensive shootout. I mean, uh, DePaul finishes with 33 points. That certainly doesn't mean they were lighting things up. Christian Lewis at quarterback, uh, or for. Barry, sorry, on the other side, he was 6 of 29 for 73 yards, one interception. That defense all over him. But on the other side, Nathan uh, McAhill, hopefully saying that one correctly, 11 for 20, 150, two tuds and an interception. N not exactly a stat padding day for anyone on that DePaul sideline. Uh, Caden Whitehead, 22 carries for 71 yards is not something that is uh, kind of jumps out of the book there. But again, it, it was all the defense especially for DePaul. They had the the one interception to take away, had five different guys with TFLs on the day, um, just a, an all-around big-time effort. And I think just timely, timely plays. It wasn't anything that, uh, you know, a 90-yard pick six or a big-time return or something of that nature. They did have a safety, though. That's kind of cool. Yeah, they, yeah, there you go. <laughs> about 15 punts combined between both these teams? Like, we're watching Big Ten football. Yeah, it's not – just Probably not the most fun game to watch. Back and forth, back and forth. That is ridiculous. Looks like the public sub looked like the Bears offense last night, man. <laughs> they, they got for you, Taylor. They got Here's a good one for you. You have your third down conversions, and oh my goodness. DePaul, who by the way scored 33 points, they were three of 14 from third down. Barry on the other side, two of 17 on third down. No wonder they had 15 punts. I mean, five that, for is, that is outrageous. But it's a testament to the defensive effort over there. But we will uh, we'll keep moving on. Just a couple quick ones to, uh, to recap here. Some other scores worth mentioning before we wrap here today, Jimmy. Um, this one off the off the top of the head here. How about number three Whitewater beating Division two Roosevelt twenty four fourteen? I watched this one. You and I both thought this was going to be a little bit more of a dominant performance from Whitewater. Roosevelt, I believe, had a touchdown called back as well and, and looked like a pretty competent squad. Whitewater off the rip, drives down the field, the length of the field, and scores. And in my head, I'm thinking, okay, here we go. First of many, this could get ugly. Roosevelt steps up, plays a really quality game against a quality opponent. Yeah, I think Roosevelt gained a lot of the respect uh, this weekend. Uh, it's funny, the, the Hanson rating says he had this game as like a 43-point spread. Yeah. And he did, he did come out and say like his uh, non-division games are it's a little bit harder to gauge that spread. But uh, man, oh man, they came in there and like you said, Whitewater smacked them in the mouth early, but they did not go anywhere. They were fighting that whole entire game. Uh, it's kind of cool. They play in Arlington Heights, and that's my hometown. So I was, I was born for Roosevelt. Uh, for sure, but uh, no, I, I think that's uh, something else, man. They came in there, only lost by 10 points, and uh, Joseph Librance, he's a running back for Roosevelt. He made like some yep. really cool graphics for us this summer, so shout out to Joseph. Pretty sweet. Same, with Team USA. Yeah, sir. Which, you know, 
didn't go quite as planned over there uh, up in uh, up in Canada. But that Roosevelt squad is definitely definitely clicking. How about number 15, Endicott? They come out of Butterfield Stadium with a 13-7 win over 24 Ithaca. I had that one on as well. Jimmy, I'll tell you what, that game was boring. Boring in the sense of like, holy shit, somebody make something happen here. Competitive as hell, but from like a just like a fan football standpoint, a boring contest. Endicott, they come out with a big time win. Uh, they're they're a team that's jumped onto the scene the last just two years, and that's a quality win over an Ithaca squad at home. Yeah, that looks like a like an Iowa Northwestern score, like November, like middle of November, like snowing, like thirteen seven. Yeah, Number five, pretty- UW Lacrosse. They win at uh, against Northern Michigan. Excuse me, thirty-five twenty-one. Another cross division opponent. Another spread that was pretty ridiculous and one where again probably thought Lacrosse might have run away with it a little bit more, but uh, ends up being a semi-competitive contest. That Lacrosse defense definitely has some holes in it that need to be figured out. Uh, offensively, the two quarterbacks that were rotating in for the Eagles both looked really competent in Weir and Haas, I believe, are the two that were, were going in there. So those guys, and for Coach Janis, are definitely looking good and trying to replicate that success of Kaiser Helterbrand. You're not going to have a guy do that, but to have two different guys go in there and bring different skill sets has looked good for the Eagles. Yeah, lacrosse has never had a hard time scoring points, and they never no. will. They're, they're just going to keep bringing in guys year after year. I mean, obviously you got Studer. Kids just going to he's a dog. Go out, go take the top off of just about any defense there is. Um, yeah, lacrosse is they're a fun team to watch, man, for sure. They are. How about number seven, Johns Hopkins? They struggle offensively a bit. Fourteen three win over Christopher Newport. Um, in talking last week on the show, coming off a big time win, having the guys dialed back in for a game like that, that was a pretty tight contest. Not anything too big note wise there, but uh, number eleven Susquehanna holds on at home. Twenty seven twenty one win over a Brockport team that we've kind of seen be that middle of tier. Usually a pretty solid defense on that side of the ball. But the one I want to talk about just a little bit, number sixteen Alma, their defense struggles a little bit again on this on the on the box score at least the Scots to get a 39-30 win at Denison so you think defense struggles but then you look at the time of possession Denison had the ball for almost 40 minutes in this one and for a defense that graduated the entirety of that starting 11 last year that is a really tall task to be out there for 40 minutes of a football game yeah and you know, came out the victory man you come out there and you only give up 30 when you're on the field for 40 minutes yeah that's uh, it's good. I mean, give up less points than you're out of than minutes on the field. That's pretty impressive stuff. Yeah, no, that is that is a very yeah. good point. That is good. So they uh, they're coming up here. So I'll get to see uh, Couch and, and Carter and those guys uh, when they make trip here to Northern Michigan this coming weekend for our homecoming game. So that'll be an exciting one. But yeah, Alma man, they're gonna have to they're gonna have to scrape out a, a couple gritty wins here. They know they're gonna have to, and uh, this weekend should be very telling. We know that again. We know that offense is gonna score points. They got a lot of offensive skill back. That defense needs to learn and how to play together and start to uh, you, you know really make these plays defensively. They need to learn how to do that fast, or else these are, they're gonna be in a lot more games just like like that yeah 100 yeah. but those are the big ones jimmy i appreciate you man have a good rest of your night looking forward to uh, another big time weekend of d3 football brother yep yes sir always always happy to be here hell yeah see you man Okay, let's close things off with the NAIA scene. And we talked all about the upsets in D2, had a good week of D3 football. But you talk about top-ranked NAIA football. There were some great games this weekend showcasing some of the top 10, 15, 20, 25 teams in the country that went head-to-head. Matt Schwarzler here to talk about all of them with myself. And uh, dare we say, starting with the best uh, of these contests? Yeah, pretty much. Um just kicking things off, we had number three, College of Idaho, this weekend travel to nine, Montana Western. Um, I've previously talked about the frontier and how these are like the two premier teams in the conference right now. I'm very high on my Montana Western, so I was very happy to see that they pulled this one out at home, 42 to 25. Um, but honestly, from the get-go, Montana Western was in control. They jumped ahead 21 to zero uh, early in the second. Didn't really give it up. College of Idaho obviously did fight back to make it competitive, but... Michael Palandry, man, for Montana Western, looks like the best player in the entire NAI right now. 19 completions for 416 yards, four touchdowns, and interception, but I think he makes yeah. up for that by getting uh, two touchdowns on the ground as well. Um, just absolutely video game unreal numbers from Palandry. And this Montana Western offense is explosive, their entire wide receiver room is contributing. Shipley had nine catches for 179 yards. Norris had five catches for 127 and two touchdowns. And Kirkley had three catches for 85 and a touchdown as well. They're spreading Fast the ball start. out. 
was definitely yeah. the uh, definitely the right way to talk about it for the uh, for the Bulldogs, and they go down seven plays, seventy six yards to kick things mm-hmm. off in this one. And College of Idaho actually came uh, and tried to respond. We're very close to actually doing just that, um, but their drive, eleven plays, seventy three yards. They ended up turning the ball over on downs, and I think that was just kind of. Uh, a great summary of how the rest of the night or day, excuse me, looking at the time of, of this one, or how the rest of the day went for them. But that going down the field, 73 yards, driving down, they turn that over on downs, and then uh, Western goes eight plays, 91 yards. Hell yeah. Right. And then followed was, by a quick three and out by the Yotes. Yeah, the Yotes could not get out of their own way. They only converted, they got points on three out of seven of their red zone trips. And that mm-hmm. includes like, Field goals, touchdowns, four times they didn't come away with any points in the red zone, which obviously if you score points there, this is a completely different game. Just couldn't punch it in when it mattered most. And that's also credit to the Montana Western defense. Uh, Ben, don't break quite literally the definition of that during this game. Um, But yeah, Montana Western looks like one of the five best teams in the country right now. I'm still super high on them. I'm sure they'll lose some dumb conference game along the way because it's the frontier. (laughs) That's just how we roll. But uh, it was not the case today. Montana Western showed that they are the top of this conference for the time being. And uh, College of Idaho has other things to work on. And it's good that this happens for them early in the season so they can have some time to regain themselves and build themselves back up. Yeah, the long ball was working incredibly well for Western. Mm -hmm. You go down the list here receiver-wise. Shipley caught a 48-yarder. Nurse caught a 44-yarder. Kirkley caught a 66-yarder. Like, Mm -hmm. these opening up the top of the defense and stretching the field vertically, those kind of plays for them, uh, combined with the fact that they're sustaining 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 play drives down the field, it felt like, at least offensively for them, looking at this, that everything was kind of going their way. Also had five different guys register TFLs on the day. Had, looks like, six different guys register pass breakups as well. So guys filling up the stat sheet defensively for Western. And, um, you know, just a lot of, like you said, a lot of really good points coming out of this one. I'm trying to look and find... Special teams wise, anything too crazy, but nothing really jumps off the top yeah, of my head. Nothing. Only three punts for either side. I mean, yeah, it was it was pretty standard on the special team side of things. It the the time of possession too, like we talked about, College of Idaho, like not being able to get it done. They won the time of possession battle thirty six minutes to twenty four is what it rounds to. Yeah, which that really Great need indicator. to capitalize. Yeah, absolutely, really Great need indicator. to capitalize on yeah. that. So. Um, like I said, not the end of the world for College of Idaho, but Montana Western, man. They look really good. I'm really excited to see him roll. And uh, Palandri just going to keep adding to his player of the year resume. Absolutely. You look at their schedule moving forward, and we'll talk preview another time. But they're on the road for the next two at Lewis and Clark College. And then you get into frontier play. The first two, uh, I guess, back into frontier play, because this was obviously their opener into the conference. Mm-hmm. But at number 23, Southern Oregon, who's coming off a big-time win. And then at home, the Bulldog Bash versus number 15, Montana Tech. So, hello, welcome back to conference play. Would not be surprised <laughs> if one of those two teams, I, you can't even say sneaks up on them because they're top 25 type opponents, but... Would not be surprised if, like you said, there's some cannibalism along the way. Also, on the other end, they play the way they did on uh, Saturday. Those are all wins. Those are all uh, put into the W column. So, uh, Destiny very much in the control of the guys in that locker room. Now, moving forward, we got Grandview, number four at number 12, Benedictine. And they take this one in a kind of a deciding 52-28 for this one. What do we need to know about this one? Yeah, super convincing win for Grandview. Um, Any question that you had about Grandview going into this game was answered, and it is Grandview is still Grandview. They still have one of the best defenses in the entire country. SP Plus right now, I believe, has this Grandview team at second in the entire country uh, with the fourth-ranked defense and the fifth-ranked offense. So the metrics don't lie. This is a really damn good Grandview team. Uh, Benedictine, obviously, coming off of a huge win earlier in the season against Morningside, um, just not quite able to put everything together. Obviously, our guy Jackson Dooley, who you know we've talked to before. Yep. Um, I don't want to say he was in a funk. He still had a pretty good day, just not able to capitalize on the scoring end of things through the air. He was 20 for 39, 288 yards, getting it done, but only an interception as the standout stat there. Uh, his main target, Jacob Gathright, though, seven catches, 
123 yards, but the story of this entire game was Grandview just ran the ball pretty much the whole game. I mean, their quarterback, Jack- Jackson Waring, only completed nine passes on the day, was like less than 50% through the air, still threw two touchdowns, did a fine job, but also 15 carries on the ground, 123 yards and a touchdown. <sighs> this Grandview team just looks like they're absolutely rolling, but this is normal for them. This is how they roll through the most of the – most of the regular season um, and Benedicted was just unfortunate enough to be in their way um, on the way to the postseason. I like that. So, I yeah. like that a lot. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great way of putting it. And I mean, you touched on it, dude, running the ball, you have two hundred yard rushers on your squad, two more above 50. And on the other side of that, nobody on the other sideline has 50 yards on the ground. So like that mm-hmm. lopsided of a, of a box score in that way is is just something that is going to always spell success for that squad. Um, defensively for them, I mean, again, they divvy it up. They had uh, six or seven different guys in the backfield making tackles behind the line of scrimmage for Grandview. And uh, I think it's just been a, a team and a name that we've has been synonymous with winning these kind of games. Good to see that they're, I guess, still able to do so, if anyone had any doubt. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They are still as good as ever, so... This one, I did have a chance to tune in and watch a good bit of. Uh, how about St. Thomas, number 10 on the road at number eight, uh, number eight St. Xavier here. St. Thomas takes this one 33-14. And looking at this one, it wasn't exactly a, a hot start for either squad. I'm, I'm sitting here kind of waiting for the fireworks to happen, it felt like, in the first kind of going into the first quarter. And it yep. just didn't really click right away. Um, now, I kept it on. And thankfully, I did because St. Thomas explodes for 21 in the second quarter. And uh, Xavier mm-hmm. would add a touchdown of their own. But, yeah, a slow start for this one, kind of feeling each other out. And then it turned into a slugfest. Yeah, this was St. Thomas taking hold really early. St. Xavier fighting back. But St. Thomas ultimately, through their defense, because um, obviously they put up most of their points in that second quarter, only scored six points the rest of the game. Their defense held on and looked really good. This St. Thomas team, after a win like this against a St. Xavier team that was ranked ahead of them, a deciding win nonetheless, this team is on a crash course with Kaiser right now, who yeah. I will mention once we kind of get down the rest of the top 25 and what happened around the country. Uh, that game is being played on October 5th, which is in about three weeks. That's close. That's close. And we're getting there, and this game is going to be absolutely fireworks. Um, in this week's poll, obviously, we have St. Thomas jumping up to eight. I wouldn't be surprised if we are looking at a top six, top five matchup in a couple of weeks. It's okay. going to be an absolutely great time. Um, St. Thomas clearly wants their revenge. Kaiser has kind of had the spotlight. Uh, for a while, and they they want to take it away from them. Uh, but just getting back into how dominant St. Thomas was in this win, Keely Watson, 23 for 31, 258 yards through the air and five touchdowns, with two of those going to receiver David Haynes, who had 12 catches and 158 yards on the day on top of those touchdowns. Um, Stuart Ross on the other side of the ball for St. Xavier, who we saw, who we've seen at quarterback for this team for a while, did okay, 26 for 46 238, two touchdowns and an interception, not as explosive as we've seen him in the past with the St. Xavier team, but definitely put him in a spot to get it done. I just think that early lead that St. Thomas jumped out to was was really difficult for them to claw back from because you saw it was just kind of slugfest in that second half, not many points being scored. Yeah, this isn't a team that, not to say they can't do it, but they're not used to having to fight back from a deficit, especially that large. And the yeah. catch that I posted on uh, on our Twitter and I believe also on Instagram from Kyle Quint here on the outside, you're watching on the bottom of the screen as I play this one, the back shoulder adjustment down the sideline. And it, again, this was like, felt like it kind of could be a momentum changer for uh, St. Xavier going down here, down 6 nothing, still in the first quarter, about four minutes left. Um what actually turned into, you know, amounting to almost nothing. A few penalties actually derailed this drive quite a bit. And, you know, Xavier starts this game off. They get the ball, and they go nine plays, 60 yards, with eating up almost five minutes a clock. And at this point, I'm watching this feeling, okay, this, this offense has uh, a decent amount of rhythm, a lot of things going for them. And that was, I mean, kind of it for them in the, in the first half. They eventually do get a score on the board. But like you said, you it's hard not to look down the uh, – look down the pipe when you uh 
when you see that that name just a couple weeks out. Obviously, you have Florida Memorial uh, a week before then, and not a team that you can just roll over or sleep on, I guess. But heading into it's an the, undefeated the Florida Memorial play. team right now, so yes. they are. Yeah, they are. They are looking decent. They're top fifty in SP plus right now. Like they are, they are not to be trifled with. So St. Thomas <laughs> better be careful. I know, and you look at the the schedule right now, and. Not to say they'll win these next two, but there's a good chance they win the, potentially these next two. You look at those four games they would have put together if they, you know, if things shake out the way that uh, everyone in that camp is hoping down there. Their last two games against top 25 opponents, the graphic they put out on Twitter is uh, quite hilarious. And uh, I don't know if you saw, it's like the cats yeah. with like the logo. <laughs> Lo- I'm always a fan of these like cool, like little AI generated type deals. Slashing yeah. out number 22 LCU last week and now to SXU number eight. And we very well could be seeing a reiteration of this graphic two weeks later with double the logos up on uh, the top of the screen. Oh, That'd be crazy. That'd be crazy. But again, can't get can't get too ahead of ourselves. I know I mentioned the Kaiser game, so it's kind of my fault. But man, it is. <laughs> I uh, it's hard not to get excited about that game. So, you know, it is yeah. what it is. <laughs> Especially when Kaiser hasn't even played an NAIA game yet, and they're two and zero. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there for sure. Um, now, quickly on to Marion and Concordia Ann Arbor. This is a matchup uh, over there that has been one of the best in the conference, I think, repeatedly. We've talked about yep. this game, I guess this matchup more specifically, a lot over the last like year or two. And um, this one, I, it just held up its end of the bargain. Once again, this game going into halftime was 24-20, to 20, and there were big plays happening on either side of the ball. The offense has settled down a little bit in the second half. What are the takeaways here from the Knights' uh, three-point narrow uh, margin of victory? Yeah, absolutely. It's refreshing to see the Sparing team be able to scrap out a game like that. Usually they are pretty dominant through the regular season, so having a test early that they're able to come out on top of, I think, is a benefit to them. And Concordia is still showing that they are a force. Um, obviously, not off to the best start that they would have hoped no. for after a couple losses, but uh, a couple tough losses, <laughs> might I add. Um, but again, this is a team, this is a program in their last year, and they are clearly still fighting. They're clearly still swinging with everything they got. This is the number six team in the country, now number five team in the country that they took down to the wire. They have to feel pretty good about their chances going into the rest of the year. They do, but at the same time, you peek ahead at the rest of the year, and let me tell you what, man, it's not getting much better. They're, the light at the end of the <laughs> tunnel, if it's there, is a dim one. Uh, you've got uh, coming up at home, number 25 coming in St. Francis. Then you go on yeah. the road at a St. Xavier team we were just talking about. A couple games in between then and uh, a Siena Heights team losing, looming on the horizon, excuse me, that we've seen play some quality ball. And finishing out two of your last three are at Indiana Wesleyan and at Taylor. You are absolutely running the gauntlet <laughs> if it's you over at CUAA. And uh, mm-hmm. they're definitely making the most of it in their last year. And like you said, though, expect nothing less than for these guys to have a literal fire potentially lit under their ass for their last uh, couple of games. And it, when you go through those ranked opponents, there will be one, maybe two of those that games that they should not win that they end up coming out on top of because mm-hmm. that seems to be very characteristic of this Concordia squad. But, absolutely. yeah, I mean, starting one and two was, was not in their bingo card. Yeah, I think it's also important to note that for Marion going forward now, they face uh, Indiana Wesleyan on October 12th, so the week yep. after that Kaiser St. Thomas game. That's another big matchup that uh, people can kind of look forward to. And that's Marion's biggest test coming up. So they get a couple weeks to, I don't want to say beat down on lesser opponents, because obviously <laughs> we've seen that this Concordia team was supposed to be a lesser opponent for them, and it was a close one. So verdict is still out on Marion, but I think that they can feel pretty good about their chances going forward, heading into that potential top 10 matchup. I mean, also just across the board for Marion, their quarterback Polk had 22 completions, 280 passing yards, a touchdown through the air and a rushing touchdown. And not to mention Jake Reichard, their receiver, had a pretty good day, you know, catching a touchdown, 68 yards on five catches. Also threw a 30-yard touchdown pass to take Barry's first lead. I did see that game. snuck into the box score there. I saw in that. In the third quarter, uh, the first time Marion takes the lead is in the third quarter off of a wide receiver, trick play, revert, you know, whatever you call it. That's uh, electric. A fantastic pass to Tyre Spence, who honestly had a really good day catching the ball as well for uh, seven receptions, 115 yards in that touchdown. Um 
God, this Marion team was just able to scrap it out and get it done. There were a couple of Concordia guys that also stood out. James Carpenter uh, on the ground for Concordia, something to work off of there. Only had five carries, but averaged 17.6 yards of carry and a touchdown with 88 total yards. You'll take that all day. Uh, and Seager DeGainer with four catches, 54 yards and two touchdowns, uh, obviously contributing to some points there. Just a really, man, Marion knows what they need to improve on but it's hard for me to get too down on them because I'm still really high on this Concordia team. I really am. I think they're a good squad. They have just the coin is that landed on their side the past couple weeks. So um, curious to see what they do from here, but Marion, man, they are, they're, they're about it. They're real this year. So you are killing it with the uh, analogies and the expressions tonight. That was another good one. That was, that was solid. (laughs) I should be taking notes as we go through this conversation, but in another life, I'm an English teacher. So, uh, (laughs) you know, like to think that's my skill. (laughs) <laughs> Let's see. Well, you're you're living up to it tonight. Those were good. That one, and then like the one earlier with like you know Benedictine was just unfortunate enough to be in their way. Like this yeah. is good shit. This is really good. I think this is not scripted. They're just yeah. solid, uh, Off right the from the dome. But mm-hmm. I think a, a big takeaway for me is last year we talked a lot about the Marion defense. I know there was one game where they had like five or six interceptions in one game from two guys, and a couple other games where they were generating some big time takeaways. This Knights defense was uh, kind of stealing the show so to speak and now it feels like to stick on the coin analogy the coin has flipped and it's the other side of the ball that is making a lot more of the headway not to say that defense has not been making plays they're gonna have to step up in a big way moving forward we talk about some of those matchups uh but it feels like the offense again has just taken a little bit more of the forefront of at least the stuff that we talk about here and, and are really holding their own this year so maybe that separates them from being a a good middle of the road top 25 team to being a top five national contender type of program that they believe they have over there. But a program we know at the top is doing quite well for themselves is Kaiser. Another win over a division two opponent, 42 33 this time over Newberry college. Yeah. I mean, again, this team just wants all the smoke all the time. It's incredible. And they're just proving time and time again, that they are the absolute cream of the crop in the NAIA. Um, I mean, against the D2 team, you have two running backs over 100 yards. Mm -hmm. Andrew Burnett had three touchdowns on the day and averaged 10 yards a carry. Jane Meisinger had five yards a carry and 105 yards on the day. My goodness. Shea Spencer, also back at the helm, looked pretty comfortable. 20 for 27, 222 yards, two touchdowns, an interception to be expected. He might be a little rusty, but... uh, Mm -hmm. Still pretty good day for them, man. This Kaiser team is just absolutely rolling. And you would know better than I would the type of opponents that uh, Newberry is. So I don't know if you want to give insight onto what kind of win this is for Kaiser. I I certainly will. And I'm looking up right now because you look at Newberry, what they've done this year. And they obviously lost to Kaiser, but they put up 33 points in the process against what we know is a quality opponent. Last week, their home opener against Valdosta State. And for those not familiar, Valdosta right now sporting what is potentially one of the best offenses in Division II football. They lose 14 to 27. So by 13 to a team that by all means is being led right now. We've had Coach Jackson on the show here, the head coach over there. We've also had Mm -hmm. their quarterback, who was a Harlan Hill finalist last year, and Sammy Edwards on the show. And this is a Valdosta State team, not to get totally on a tangent, but last year was averaging almost 40 points a game. They held them to 27 is a great number uh, for a Newberry College team that maybe has underperformed in some people's eyes. But if we're just judging off what we've seen in 2024, that is a very, very quality win from that Kaiser squad. Uh, This Newberry team, I guess in more... Recent history, I'm trying to think. It doesn't doesn't let me go back um, schedule wise. I don't know off the top of their head. Um, I'll have to find their schedule from last year. But I think you look at that that game last year against Valdosta, and that kind of tells you all you need to know about this squad and what they've been capable of this year. So, and again, we, we talk about all this about Kaiser. This is something that they, they've kind of been doing. Newberry was 4-7 and seven last year. But, again, to some uh, really tough losses along the way to top squads like Lenore Rhine, Limestone, mm-hmm. Wingate, Mars yeah. Hill, all playoff caliber teams. So there you have that. Um, but this is all something, too, with, again, we use the air quotes, a new head coach and someone uh, – calling the shots here for this Kaiser squad. He's had a lot of success as well as uh, Sosha, right, at, at, that moved up to Lenore Ryan? Yes, yeah. Yeah, 
they're doing just fine too. And I talked about them earlier in the show. So it seems to me this is like the equivalent of like the Stafford golf trade. I know there was no physical trade that <laughs> took place. Both these teams are doing just fine uh, with the with the new men in charge. Absolutely. Yeah, this Kaiser team has not skipped the beat at all. They look as good as they've ever been. So I think they'll just they'll be just fine going forward and adding another D2 into the belt before that head on collision they got coming with St. Thomas. So I'll be on record too. I knew Meisinger was coming back. I did not know Burnett was coming back this year. I just for whatever reason, maybe just didn't do enough research. The fact that like that might be the most textbook one two punch in the NAIA right now, especially when it comes to the ground attack. We saw a ton of them last year. Uh yeah. <laughs> that's a problem. I mean the fact that those two as well, like they're not the type of backs that are typically like the smaller scat type of deal. Yeah. These are bruising type of backs. But then we talk like the long on both these guys. Meisinger had a 60 yarder. Burnett had a 75. Like that's not typical from this offense. And when you combine those two for 34 carries, that beats the shit out of an opposing defense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, it's important to mention Meisinger was ahead of another, was a part of another two headed monster. Excuse me. Tripped up on my words there. Um, <laughs> just a couple of years ago, uh, this Kaiser team is very used to running this two back system. Yep. Um, in previous years, they have had, I'm trying to remember his name. Marquez Burgess uh, was okay. the starting quarterback there for a long time. Had like 5,000 career rushing yards for them or something ridiculous. Like, Absolute monster. Meisinger knows what it takes to su succeed in this backfield. And he's clearly comfortable being in the two-back system because he's thriving like he has his entire career on it. Yeah, staying fresh, still getting 20 carries in a two-back system is absurd, but we love to see yeah. that and have the ground yeah. attack going. Now, uh, quick notes on the uh, Indiana Wesleyan. They have a loss to FCS Valpo, 17-20 to away game for the Wildcats. And Valpo jumps out to a 14-0 lead. Wesleyan makes this interesting in the third quarter. Then in the fourth, they tie it up. They score uh, 17 to tie things up at 17 and uh, a fourth Fourth quarter field goal, excuse me, from Valpo. Valpo would seal the deal, at least when it came to uh, to scoring. After the field goal, there was uh, the ensuing Indiana Wesleyan drive interception. That's how that one ended on just the second play of the drive, and they just couldn't get anything going. They went three and out in their final drive of the game. Yeah, I mean, this was – I can't really discredit Indiana Wesleyan too much, obviously. This is one of those pioneer teams in FCS Division One that is kind of weird to talk about, but – it's yeah. still Division One at the end of the really day. Really hard um, to gauge, right? Yes, it's super hard to gauge. And this is a Valpo team that Indiana Wesley had squeaked by last year. This is very traditionally a series that has very close games. Um, so I don't think it's anything Indiana Wesley needs to worry about too much. I mean, they've split this series 2-2 two -two apiece. So there, it's it's competitive. Uh, credit to Indiana Wesley. And, I mean, the name of the game was just... Valpo's defense smothered Indiana Wesley's offense for a majority of this game, and that's what they need to figure out going forward. They don't have a clear-cut guy, it seems like, on this offense for Indiana Wesleyan. Uh, Roosevelt Cage has done all right. You know, their quarterback has done all right. Isaac Smith's had a pretty okay season. But there's not a guy who is separating himself like we're seeing with these other top teams, like we're seeing with the Montana Westerns, like we're seeing with the Kaisers. And it's... It's definitely worth noting. I think that this is a good test for this Indiana Wesley team to see where they were at. They know what they need to fix. I feel like I'm saying this a lot, but when you're playing these D2, D1 opponents, it's it's hard not to find silver linings in this sort of stuff. Yeah, I'm right with you there, and we'll stick right on that train of thought. Georgetown versus Alabama A&M, and this one I think the, the biggest takeaway for me, the Tigers end up losing 24-16 in what was a competitive uh, not incredibly competitive. I think the score is a little bit deceiving in that Alabama kind of did come away with this one in the second half, and, and Georgetown scores some points late here. But still, I mean, you lose by less than 10 points. That's a that's a solid contest. I think the biggest takeaway is their offense did not seem to miss too much of a step. 19 for 34, maybe not the best completion percentage for uh, Gehrig. Is it Sluniker there? Sluniker, yeah, For, uh, yep, for, uh, sure for Georgetown. But uh, one touchdown, no takeaways through the air, no interceptions. Had uh, multiple guys over 50 yards there receiving and spread the ball out, seemed like quite a bit. Had seven different guys involved TFL-wise. Had four, five, six, seven guys over five tackles apiece, three over ten. I mean, this Georgetown defense must have been all over the field. I did not get to tune into this one. Did generate one takeaway interception. Um, 
again, not a program necessarily I'm familiar with, but it seemed like a good result. Yeah, totally losing a great wise. result. Uh, yeah, losing wise, I think it's important to mention this Alabama A and M team is full scholarship. Uh, yep. This is a program no that is there. yeah, no pioneer league there. These are guys who are uh, getting money to play D one football there. So this is a fantastic result. I think if you're looking at this from Georgetown's perspective, you never want to lose. I understand that, but again, it's we're in different circumstances here. I think Gary Sluniker going and not having the day that he had his first game of the season. I think we mentioned that last week too. He threw four interceptions in his first contest. Um, Being able to distribute the ball. And yes, he didn't, you know, explode for these huge plays and like all this stuff, but he did a great job managing the ball against what is supposed to be far and away superior competition. Darius Neal got involved, had 80 yards on the day. We are still seeing Darius Neal not as involved as we've seen in the past, or at the very least, defenses are keying in on him. So it's key for Sluniker to build up his confidence that this Georgetown offense wants to really blow up and help out its defense that has been doing so well. Yeah, I'm with that. And there's a couple, uh, you know, we'll stay on the silver linings train, I guess, here. Um, yeah. For these guys, for, from an NAI perspective, from a player perspective, you get to put some of these plays on tape against, like you talked about, a full scholarship Division One program. And, you know, you don't like to think from that perspective, but there are some guys that are like, let me get some good stuff on tape and see if I can move up a level. There's a lot of guys who have those aspirations, but then also guys who have the aspirations of playing after college, right, at the next level. Yeah. And you would imagine those plays should probably be at the forefront of whatever highlight tape they're putting together. You yes. also <laughs> have to imagine that uh, Georgetown is getting a check to go over and play a game of this caliber. So what that number is, I don't even want to speculate. I have no idea, but uh, you're not doing this out of the goodness of your heart and showing up to a D1 and, and to play a game like this. Yeah, no, uh, this is, I think, just a net positive for Georgetown. I think I feel more confident in their abilities going forward this season from what we saw at the beginning of the year um, from them. And uh, I think they'll head into conference play with their heads held high, and I'm excited to see how it goes for them. Give me the quick notes on Morningside, 28-21 over Midland this weekend. Yeah, I was really high on this Morningside team going into the the season. Um, I don't know if that is the case anymore. Uh, Their quarterback, who we mentioned the previous week, had like 500 yards and a bunch of touchdowns. Uh, Zach, uh, gosh, I always butcher this name. Uh, Chavalier, I think. Um, I really hope it is. I think it's French. (laughs) Um, But yeah, this uh, not a fantastic day throwing three picks. Um, only completing 15 passes, 200 yards, two touchdowns on the day. So they're still getting it done through the air. They're still trying to focus on it through the air. But Ryan Cole on the ground for Morningside has showed up in a big way during this game, 163 yards rushing, an average of six yards a carry, two touchdowns and a long of 88 yards. That's a, oh, yeah. that's a pretty long trot. Oh, yeah. get it done. Um, One of those Mike, interceptions was to this man, Treden Davis Reed. He was our player of the week defensively yep. for the NAI this week. And we've talked about him, I think, a while back on the program. Midland's not a team we maybe focus on too much, but they've put together some quality games. He had nine tackles. That one takeaway you mentioned, forced to fumble, recovered, said fumble. Big time outing uh, for the linebacker there for the war- Warriors, I do believe. Yes, Warriors. Yeah, the Warriors. And um, Midland's defense has always been good. That's always been the highlight of their team. Um they always get really good transfers in and the recruits that they get to play on their D-line and their linebacker room are always really great. So I'm honestly not surprised that they have a defensive player of the week uh, yep. turned out of there. This was a really impressive result for Midland, a Midland program that is traditionally fighting for a top 25 <laughs> spot every year. Um, I think this proves that Midland is definitely in the contest towards the top of the G-Pack this year, kind of in that tier that we see like Dort at the top of. Um and I still just don't know what to think of Morningside. They're kind of freaking me out. Um, <laughs> they're a bit shakier than I would like them to be. But at the end of the day, I always say it, Morningside is Morningside. Until I am proven wrong and they lose three games, I have no choice but to but to still assume everything's going fine. So Yeah. No, I'm with you there. If anyone's yeah. going to figure it out, it's them. And uh, moving yeah. forward, last two here, 16 16- Dickinson State loses a close one to a Wisconsin Stout 22-20. I mean, this Dickinson State squad were 10-2 and two last year, and I honestly don't think Stout had any idea. Yeah. Um, Talking with Jimmy earlier, I mean, it, 
that's basically was the sentiment. They did not know what they were getting themselves into and were lucky to come away with. Not lucky, maybe is not the right word, but they had to scrap that one out. Yeah, they definitely had to scrap it out. The problem for me here is that with Dickinson State, they every year are hesitant, like the pollsters are hesitant to put them super high because they usually win the North Star, which traditionally has been a weak conference. Mm-hmm. Um, and they usually just blow through the regular season because they are far and away better than everybody in the North Star. And so by the time the playoffs roll around, nobody really knows what to think of them. And in recent memory, they've been bounced in the first round quite a few times. They've won that game sometimes, but usually they're one and done. I don't think I feel much better about Dickinson State after this game. I think this is a game they should have won, if I'm being completely honest with the talent that they have on that team. No, no ill will to Wisconsin Stout. I'm sure, they're a great program, but this is a Dickinson State team who is supposed to be thrashing the rest of the competition. And when you bring in a G, uh, a D three team that you should probably beat, you should get it done. Yep. <laughs> no, agreed. Now I mean, the rest still, of the country doesn't know what to think. So. Still a still a YAC squad, but Stout has not been yep. a team that has performed very well in that conference. They're on the bottom tier of of that, um, and it's just kind of been the way it is. But to close it out, Olivet Nazarene they win uh, the cross MSFA clash against Siena Heights overtime one twenty to fourteen. Here, the biggest one that jumps out to me here for the Tigers. Time of possession, almost 47 minutes to 28. Yep. At the end of the day, what, that's going to get I, it done. I was doing some math there because the math was not mathing. I forgot overtime. You had that <laughs> into there. Time, I was yeah. very confused. <laughs> uh, but, yes, for those wondering, almost 47 to about 28 of, uh, of Siena. That's big. That's absolutely huge. And this was a very well-rounded effort from all of it, Nazarene. Obviously, the defense has shined in this game. If you're going past regulation and still only putting up a total of 14 combined points, or uh, 34, excuse me, combined points. Um, so, obviously, defensive scrap. Sienna Heights, I noted for their defense in previous years, um, still have a very good defense. Uh, if you liked offense, this game, do not – do not watch it. It will be <laughs> painful to watch. Um, but if you want to see good defense, this is definitely one for you. And all of it, Nazarene getting a big in conference with Siena Heights has not won a game yet this year, which is, which I think outrageous. Is, I mean, strength of schedule is obviously a huge yes. part of that, but still. Yeah. Still very notable because I think the Siena Heights team is very good. I think SP plus still has them as a top 50 team, which I completely agree with. Uh, just an absolute bummer to lose in overtime like that. Siena Heights will be fine. All the Nazarenes had a pretty decent start to the season, though, um, especially after a year the past, you know, 2023, where they struggled just a little bit um, more so than usual. So good to see yeah. they're back on track. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. Thank you for breaking it down with me. I appreciate you as always. Excited uh, to hopefully tune in some more of these games. You see my setup on Saturday of the games I was watching? I did. <laughs> I did. Pretty decent. <laughs> Pretty, Pretty decent. decent. Yeah. Chilling in the basement, me and Buzz, four, sometimes five games on at a time. That's how, that's the life, man. It's not bad. It's not bad. There are definitely worse ways to live. There are. Not a single Division One game in sight. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Don't ask me about the Apple Cup, by the way. I don't want to talk about it. Was, <laughs> we left it off. We left it off. Dude. yeah we'll leave it we'll leave it there we'll leave it there my friend but thank you once again matt i really do appreciate you man yeah of course i'll see you around man have a good rest of your night you too